Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I'm chair of APA's New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, February 8th, 2019. We will be hearing the presentation, Public vs. Private Perspectives, the development process as told by a developer, engineer, planner, and city manager. We have a lot of folks on this call today. There's already over 500 folks uh, tuned in with a projected possibly three more, 300 more folks joining us. So obviously this is a popular topic. We wanna get right to it. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown. For your content questions related to the presentation, again, you can just type those in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar, and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. I'll just ask that if it's if your question is for a particular panelist that you state which panelist you would like to answer the question. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions. I apologize, it, it looks kind of funny on the screen. I just threw it up here now. We're getting more chapters and divisions in every day, so please uh, stay tuned. If you're looking down the list and you don't yet see your chapter or division listed, we always just ask that you reach out to them and you suggest that they join us. Today's webcast in particular is sponsored by the Colorado chapter of the American Planning Association. So thanks to them for pulling this relevant webcast together. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, which is available for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account, and then you can search for CM activities by either the event number or title of today's webcast. Again, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. As I said, this webcast is available for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We will very shortly have two distance education sessions available. Uh, one that will be available for 1.5 law credits and another that will be available for 1.5 ethics credits. So please stay tuned for those as we're applying for them as we speak. And uh, like us on Facebook, planning webcast series to receive up-to-date information on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. Just head over to youtube.com and search planning webcast. There you'll be able to get a recording of this and over 300 other webcasts that we have done throughout this over 10 years. Uh, so you can search and view those. And we'll also have a PDF of the presentation available at the conclusion of today's session. Uh, on our webcast webpage, again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. All right, I'm done with my housekeeping items. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Anita, who will kick us off. Anita, it's all you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, my name is Anita Seitz, and I'm the Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Westminster in Colorado. Um, I have been on Westminster City Council for um, just a little over five years. And over that course of time, I've really learned both the power, um, importance, and value of planning um, and community development in my ability as an elected official to reach the goals for my community. Um, as an elected official, um, and all of the elected officials that you either present to as um, private planners uh, working with the developer um, or as public planners that are working directly with the elected officials have the desire to, to, to have good government. They want to be fair, equitable, and transparent. Um, they want to make good decisions for their city, um, but land use decisions are often the most stressful decisions that we as electeds have to face because there's so much pressure often applied on us 
whether it's from a developer who's decided to go political or if it's residents who have kind of a NIMBY attitude to a development that's going on behind us. And that's why it's so valuable for us to understand both the goals, the challenges, and the realities of all of the different players in development, um, the goals um, behind our own criteria that we are supposed to use um, to make these quasi-judicial land use decisions. Um, and so I feel that this, um, today, this program is incredibly helpful to remember um, how to communicate to those elected officials that are ultimately often the ones making the decision that will um, determine if a development is to go forward or not. Um, and so with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Randy. Um, hold on one second while I read his bio to you. Um, Randy Hunt is a PhD and an AICP. He um, has been a professional planner for 31 years, and for the past two and a half, he has been a community development director for Greater Estes Park. Um, that's both a town and a county. Previously, Randy held positions in Wyoming, Florida, New Hampshire, and Virginia, among other places. His specialty is in resort, tourist, and higher education communities. Randy, will you please take it over? Thank you, Anita. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're located. Randy Hunt, thank you again, Anita, for that great intro. And the one item I might add to that is that I, in addition to being the professional planner, uh, I also come from a family of elected officials. So day, evening, overnight, we're real conscious uh, in my personal life of uh, good interactions with our elected officials. Hopefully I can bring some uh, insights for, for all of you guys. Uh, Anita, next slide, please. Um, oh, you know, I should add, uh, I would be remiss in our uh, Chamber of Commerce would not forgive me if I didn't say Estes Park is beautiful this time of year. Please visit us, bring your friends, your family, and your money, and we'll be happy to see all three of those things. So into the uh, webinar, um, the, as Anita and uh, Chris may have mentioned, this began life, the webinar did last year as a, a, an item for elected officials. So it's also very important for our uh, planning population to know how to communicate. Some of these slides are oriented toward the elected officials and uh, hopefully this will give you all some good tools for that. Um, the first item here is things that we'd like our elected officials to know. And these all have a common theme, which I think could be summarized as behind the scenes, there's a lot that happens. And uh, your elected officials may not always know all of the things that go on. They'll have a good general sense, of course, especially those who are veterans. So to run through a few representatives here, uh, for elected officials, the packet, materials, and staff are only the important tip of the iceberg. This is important because uh, it, I think more so, especially for new elected officials, they may not realize all the discussions that happen both with the uh, developers, with the community, and with the other agencies and staff who do the technical reviews that go into the final product that shows up in the packet. Um, it's important to let them know that a lot of this work behind the scenes has, uh, in effect, sorted things out for the elected officials and that uh, they're seeing um, only the tip of the iceberg. It is, of course, the most important tip because that's where the decision happens, where the rubber meets the road. Um, next, I've mentioned that um, we try to give our elected officials good tools and clean choices on each project. Uh, th this is real relevant, I think, because what happens in uh, that month, two month, whatever time frame leading up to when something shows up as a public hearing or on an agenda is uh, stuff that actually sorts out what the choices will be in the end. Now, we as planners all know this, and uh, those of us who've done it for a while, we kind of do it uh, routinely, you know. But our elected officials don't always realize that what they're getting is a, a series of choices that have already been outlined, not necessarily made, but outlined for 
uh, the uh, final stage in the process. And uh, that is a little hard to convey in a staff report. I think it comes more through uh, repeated exposure to the land use issues. As Anita said, a lot of the land use issues are the most important ones. So that's, that's very useful to uh, be able to provide as a summary, I think. Um, for better or worse, elected officials always seem to get the tough cases. And that isn't always apparent again to the newer officials in particular. Um, you know, one of the comments I hear routinely have my whole career is, gee, how come every staff report says staff recommends approval? What happens to the denials? How come you guys aren't screening and uh, taking better care and so on? And that's an understandable reaction if 60, 70% of the cases do have recommendations for approval. Uh, that, that isn't uncommon in my experience. Um, I have a, another slide later that'll uh, touch on this a little more, but basically the elected officials, it's good for them to know that a lot of the, especially the flat no, this isn't gonna work type cases, don't ever reach them as public hearings. We, we do our best to, uh, you know, let the folks know, well, this is going to be kind of an uphill climb for you. And, uh, you know, think twice before you spend the money and get all the plans ready and so on. Um, the fourth thing here is real important. And I know all of us who are planners are aware of this. We're all familiar with the AICP code of ethics, but the elected officials may not always uh, have that access or, or full understanding of what's in our code of ethics. So the key point here is that for our elected officials, the um, constituencies are always the uh, current population, oftentimes the current voters. And of course, those are important and we all will have to deal with our current communities. But for planners, of course, our horizons are a little different. We look at uh, future generations, I always think of it as we're planning for people who aren't here yet, in some cases, people who aren't even born yet. And uh, we also pay close attention to the diversity of the community and are aware that not everyone is, uh, you know, able to speak with the same voice or has the same representation. Uh, our elected officials over the years, I've been doing this three decades now, I've come a long way and are uh, really good for the most part. In fact, it's unusual to have exceptions. They, they're aware of the diversity and the need that uh, future generations are gonna have. But it's also important to remind them that if we have a built project, it's on the ground for 40, 50, sometimes up to 100 or more years, and that people who are not here yet are the uh, ones that we also need to pay attention to. It's easy for elected officials to listen to those at the podium thinking, well, okay, that's the story, you know, we're, we're hearing from the public, but it is more complicated. And I think it helps if we remind in uh, respectful ways that, you know, there's, there's future as well as present going here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So the rest of that iceberg, what goes on behind the scenes, again, many of us in the profession know these things, but these are good things to remind our elected folks as well. Um, one of the things we get questions of uh, our planning staff here a lot and have my whole career uh, everywhere I've worked is, you know, you file a project or you see a project filed in say February and the public hearing isn't until May. What the heck happens between February and May? Why does it take so long? That can be a citizen question as well. Um, and it's good to remind and, and sometimes to outline in a staff report or in a presentation that there are a lot of other agencies in involved in the whole process. The fire department needs to review for their code. We've got to hear from the water and wastewater folks, the uh, infrastructure generally is always very important for a particular project that demands services. Uh, things like law enforcement or emergency responders, those are bases we need to touch. Um, I'll always uh, wanna throw in our state transportation departments because uh, for a lot of us, our state highways and our transit 
systems and so on have a heavy state or even federal component. And we need to hear from those folks as well. So it's good to remind our elected officials that there are a lot of players. And again, that tip of the iceberg only happens or only gets to them when the players are uh, all assembled. Um, elected officials get a lot of calls and emails about the big projects. And it, uh, just a reminder, we as staff get those too. And hopefully they are reflected in our staff reports. I've lost count of the number of times in my career that citizens have called us and say and said, what about such and such, you know, what about this other project that uh, we know is coming along and we've said, huh, you know, we need to pay attention to. So as long as we're aware and keep our ear to the ground, I think it's good to have that reminder. Um, we all know, but as planners, but our elected officials don't always that. Staff recommendations are important and that many developers work hard to avoid a recommendation to deny. I'm always kind of, even after 30 odd years, bemused by how much power uh, the developers seem to think we have. I'm not so sure it's always as much, but uh, it is an important component. And of course we uh, work our best to get good projects online. Next please, thank you. So um, meeting with a developer. Now this is a question that comes up a lot, especially in Colorado and in, in Florida where I used to work other states, I think most states now have open meetings laws and expectations on when elected officials and other uh, folks can meet with the developer and under what circumstances. It's always been a gray area and it's been evolving during my career. Um, I had three points I wanted to make here. One is that for elected officials or planning commissioners, meeting with a specific developer or development team especially after the application is filed, it's a formal process underway, is a pretty murky area. Ex parte concerns, uh, meaning uh, talking outside the public view or outside the public eye can be very concerning. It can, in worst case scenarios, lead to violations of open meeting. So something to be very cautious with. Now as staff, we have the ability to, to have, the, in fact, the necessity to have those conversations, but, for our elected officials, it's uh, it's easy. You know, we've we've all seen it, and uh, uh, the ability to be in the supermarket produce aisle and have to say to a constituent, you know, we we should talk about this in the meeting. Be there on the 21st or whatever is important. Um, again, we as staff can help with that. Uh, by by having those conversations and summarizing in a staff report or presentation. Now, the second point is one that I know not all planners agree on, and I, I this is my belief. I want to clearly label it as such, but uh, meeting with a developer or development team in a group setting without a specific project on the table is valuable. Um, it, it, it's somewhat controversial. I know in some localities, meeting with uh, developers outside of specific needs can be difficult, but I have found it valuable over the years. And, and one tip I'll mention that I found especially valuable is um, if you meet with a developer and ask them questions, things like, so how hard is it to borrow money these days? After the 2008 crisis, we ran into a lot of folks who said, you know, it's gotten real tough to get a bank loan now and, and we need more time on your development review cycle. Your, your deadlines and code may be a problem. So those are important advanced indicators to know. I think that does help. One other tip I'll mention on this one is if you can meet with two or more developers, that helps because it, number one, avoids the ex parte problem or ability to fall by accident into a specific project. And number two, no two developers are gonna reveal each other's projects or, or want to reveal their own projects to each other. So you kind of keep things level on, uh, on the playing field that way. Third one is field visits, and I'm talking here about group field visits with your planning commission or your elected officials. Again, this is one to be very cautious of. In Florida, for example, even two, or when I was working there at least, even two elected officials or planning commissioners on a field visit was a, a meeting by Florida Sunshine Law, so that's a difficult one. But uh, in Colorado, we have three or more, and I believe that's a, a more a rational standard. But the point here is field visits with uh, decision makers in small numbers can be very valuable. 
the caution at the bottom, be sure your attorney is okay with this idea and also be sure you have permission from the landowner or property owner to visit. But I have lost count of how many times I've found uh, how valuable that can be for the, uh, for the decision makers. Next, please. Uh, my canaries in the coal mine. So I love to talk about my canaries. Now, most of what I've been talking about, of course, is development project specific, but uh, a lot of us are long range planners, right? And we need to think about not just our true vision in long range, comprehensive plans and so on, but how our code health and maintenance needs to be kept up with. So my analogy is the canaries in the coal mine. Now I started my career and, and, my, and my life in Appalachia. I was uh, started out in Southwest Virginia. Some of you may know that country next to West Virginia, it's coal mine country. Uh, there's an old story and I think there's some truth to it. I've never talked to anybody who actually did it, but that back in the old days of underground mines, they used to put canaries in the coal mines and when the canaries got a whiff of methane gas or something poisonous, they were the leading indicator, you better get out of the mine. One canary, maybe not so bad, you might have just got a bad canary, but you know, two or three, you look out for trouble. So it, our codes are like our coal mines, we need to keep an eye on their health, and they do get out of date faster than you may think. Uh, cell towers, just for those of you who've been around a while, you remember the days when cell towers were springing up everywhere and it kind of caught a lot of us by surprise. So uh, one of the leading indicators is if you start getting a lot of variances for things like cell towers, patio homes, things like that, uh, watch your code because you may need to adjust. So the variances are really your leading indicator. Watch your Board of Adjustment or Board of Zoning Appeals or whatever it may be called where you are, the body that approves your variances because they're uh, going to, to give you your best clue, especially if you start getting variance after variance for the same thing. Maybe that's telling you that events out there in the real world are evolving and your code is staying still and you know you want to take a look um don't wait till you have 20 canaries with their little feet in the air because uh your your code's going to need help before you get there so the lesson here is stay in touch with your board of adjustment they're your veterinarians for code diagnosis and they'll help you had to throw in a piece about long-range planning because that's my true love here i believe i've done it anita back over to you Thank you so much, Randy, um, for that perspective um, and, and words of wisdom. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Carrie McCool. Um, Carrie is the founder and principal of McCool Development Solutions, a land use consulting firm that specializes in providing municipal planning and design services to Colorado's small to mid-sized communities. Ms. McCool's community development experience includes all aspects of planning, wherein much of her work focuses on downtown revitalization, market-based planning, developing comprehensive plans, development code revisions, current planning, diagnosis and drafting of land use policies, design standards and guidelines, preparing implementation strategies and action plans, as well as community engagement strategies and consensus building. She has held professional planning positions with local government agencies, providing um, planning consulting services to various municipalities across the state, as well as representing private developers along virtually every jurisdiction in the front range. Her focus is bridging the gaps between the public and private sectors by providing extensive land use planning, revitalization, and development services throughout the state of Colorado. Ms. McCool is passionate about building strong communities, revitalizing downtowns, and creating healthy local economies. She is a past president of Downtown Colorado, Inc., and is an accomplished speaker that is presented at the American Planning Association, Saving Places, and DCI conferences. Ms. McCool holds a master's degree in urban and regional planning from the University of Colorado, Denver, and a bachelor's degree in international affairs from the University of Hawaii. Carrie, please take it over. Thank you, Ms. Anita, for that great intro. I am thrilled to be here today and to wear my developer hat. Next slide, please. Sorry. 
<laughs> no problem. Sorry, there we go. Okay, thank you, thank you. So we all know this, the planning process is often daunting. I have a little secret for everybody. Um, I, I have found that most developers are really scared to death of public hearings. Um, they are, these images that you see here are really their worst nightmare. So I wanted to start off talking about um, what the developer's role is in the entitlement process. And as Anita pointed out, uh, most of our practice at McCool Development Solutions is uh, providing municipal planning services to small to mid-sized communities throughout the West but we also represent developers. So um, I couldn't help myself but um, use this picture of Rodney Dangerfield because when I think of developer, this is, this is who, who I think of. And, and they know what their role is, but often as planners, we need to remind our elected and appointed officials what their role is in the development review process. They need to learn and respect the adopted rules and processes. They can't claim they don't know. Um, they have to have an understanding of the role of government. They really need to communicate issues and concerns um, from the very beginning, from the pre-application meeting and throughout. And they really need to have a, they need to have realistic expectations of the development review process. Next slide. There are five key things that developers really expect in the entitlement process. The first is predictability. There are a number of ways to achieve this. Um, the first is to make sure that your long range planning documents are up to date. You know, take a look at them every three to five years. Just really make sure that they're up to date. Why? Because developers really go to your long range documents. That's the first document that they go to when they're considering a project in your community. So it's really important to keep those up to date. The second is to ensure that you have streamlined land use regulations. Um, there's a number of ways to, to techniques to make sure that uh, your regulations are streamlined. Um, the first is to reorganize your ordinances to create a more logical document. Zoning ordinances change over time. New sections are added or moved as uh, new issues arise. And uh, over time, the, uh, this process can result in a confusing document for readers trying to find like a specific standard or procedure that they need to follow for their project. And it's, it's not uncommon. Um, there's a lot of communities that don't have the money um, to have uh, do a very thorough uh, land use code update all at one time and so a lot of communities uh, utilize a piecemeal approach and it just leads to confusion so um, it's best to uh, take the time to reorganize your ordinance and make sure that it's in a logical format. Um, you can simplify confusing standards. It's no secret that uh, zoning standards can be confusing. They're oftentimes confusing for developers as well. Um, when we help communities write regulations, we really focus on writing for the average citizen. Um, no need to um, use jargon and those types of things. You be sure to use clear, concise language when you're um, looking at your standards. Uh, increase the use of graphics. Uh, graphics and pictures can go a long way to help developers visualize the standard. Um, you don't have to, it's not necessary to illustrate every single standard, but only those that are complex and that would, would benefit from uh, graphic representation. Um, the next is make sure that the developer has an understanding of the review criteria. Spend time with the developer at your uh, first pre-app meeting and going through the submittal requirement and your review criteria because as we know as planners this is going to be the heart of our staff report right so they need to be reminded of what the review criteria is for your community and they need to address it and so reminders throughout the process is really good um, Last but not least, no surprises. This is absolutely the, the biggest complaint I hear from 
um, my developer clients is um, that they were surprised by uh, in the second round of review comments they they have a new huge issue that they have to address that wasn't brought up in the in the first round um, really try to avoid that any any time you can um, the the unpredictability of the public process is difficult enough so um, as you're going through your uh, development review just making sure that there's no surprises is is really a good way to go next slide flexibility is really important to developers as well uh, they do look at the code and if your code does offer some um, administrative uh, leeway that is oftentimes really the best uh, take a look at your code and see if there's some provisions for administrative adjustments typical adjustment amounts of ver for variations um, permitted from ordinance standards is 10 percent so that could be a 10 percent deviation from like setbacks or lot coverage maximum total sign area those types of things Developers really like to see that flexibility. They also like to see that um, there is confidence in staff. Uh, get to know your elected and appointed officials so that developers are confident that you know how to best um, help them address uh, comments, um, community concerns, um, and public concerns as well. Next slide. Having the resources available to the development community is really important as well. Um, having public information guides or user guides is a really good example. These user guides can have like submittal checklists, um, uh, provide some indication of the development review timeline, uh, those types of things. Um, also, uh, don't hesitate to uh, include work product samples. Like, for example, if you have a, uh, you know, go in your files and find a site development plan that just whizzed through the development review process, had everything that you needed um, to review the application on in one document, that worked well for your staff, for your community. Include samples in your user guides. Um, make sure that your fee schedule is up to date, that you're competitive, and um, that you're in line with the market as well. Developers, uh, one thing I've noticed too is, you know, they're 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 night creatures. Um, <laughs> they do a lot of work at odd hours and a lot a lot of times at night. So having your community's website up to date and having great online resources, like having your public information user guides available online, having your zoning map available online, and your most uh, recent version of your land use regulations is really invaluable to the development community. Next slide. So this is pretty, um, Elementary, everybody knows communication is key, but you really can't hit on it enough. Um, I tell my elected and appointed officials all the time that your staff is your resource. The same is true for developers. Um, planners are really the conduit for information, whether that be interdepartmental between boards and commissions and to the community at large. So. Um, we as planners, we're really the head of the marching band and developers want to, again, have confidence in knowing that, that you too see yourself as that resource and uh, facilitating that communication um, through all those levels. The Having an understanding also of the development community challenges is really important and it was really great, Randy touched on this a bit. Um, just asking the developer, you know, yeah, what are your, uh, how, how easy is it to get a loan these days? Um, that was a great example that Randy pointed out. Um, figuring out what what is their challenge in the particular uh, development review process? Is it more, is it timing? Is it fees? Um, the more that you know as a planner about what 
their challenges are, the better that you will be equipped to come up with a win-win solution to address that. Investing in collaboration and education is uh, really, really important through the communication process as well. Um, hosting, and a good example is hosting work sessions with developers. I found that they really like to be um, looked at as uh, industry leaders and they like to talk about their, um, their challenges and having those joint work sessions and, and, and uh, addressing issues as a team is a more collaborative approach that often works wonders through the entitlement process. Next slide. So the, since I started with letting you all know and letting you know the big secret that developers are absolutely terrified of the public process, I'd like to, to uh, talk a little bit about what is an effective public hearing what it is not, and then I will leave you with some public hearing tips. So what is an effective uh, public hearing? It is one where everyone has had the opportunity to be heard. That's very important. That uh, It's one where relevant issues are addressed. It's one where there's no rabbit holes uh, pursued for too long. A lot of communities have uh, utilize timers or you know traffic lights that they've <laughs> put on their walls um, to uh, make sure that uh, the public and the developer oftentimes too is not uh, speaking for too long and the average is two to three minutes for that uh, it is uh, one where people are felt they're felt that they're they're heard and they're understood and that everybody feels respected through the process. And next slide. And what they are not, and this is really important, and as planners, we all like to commiserate, and we should, uh, this is a good reminder that an effective hearing is not everybody left happy, <laughs> it's really not everybody got what they wanted, and it's not everybody loves the city council, town board, or in this case, in the planners, um, the city, town, or county planner. Um, we have a hard job sometimes, but just know that that's not what uh, an effective hearing, public hearing is all about. And then last slide. And then I will leave you with a few public hearing tips. Um, make sure that your council and your town board or board of county commissioners, they make sure that they have a thorough understanding of your long range planning documents um, and also of your land use regulations. Again, it's really important to build a relationship with your elected and appointed officials. Um, make sure that they feel that they can come to you uh, for questions. So making sure that the, the door is open for them is is really imperative in helping uh, ease through the entitlement process. Also make sure that their homework is completed. Um, send your packet materials out well in advance. Make sure it goes out early. Again, make yourself available for any questions. And have them visit the site. Um, it's really important for them to have a lay of the land. Randy touched on it in his presentation, but make sure that you have a standard procedure for these types of field visits because that's really important as well. And last but not least, make sure that your, uh, oh, next slide please. Well, the last slide is uh, making sure that your elected and appointed officials make their decisions based on finding a fact. This is really, really important. Um, what we do in a lot of our communities is um, when we are representing the community is provide for potential motions in your staff reports. That's often helpful for your elected and appointed officials. And it's also helpful for the developer as well take some time to go over your staff report and your staff recommendation with them in advance of the public hearing as well. And that makes for a smooth uh, public hearing and there 
will be no surprises. So with that, um, I am wrapped up and I will turn it back to Anita for her introduction to Craig. Are you there, Carrie? Yes, I'm here. I'm all done. Okay, I'm going to turn it over now to um, Pearl. Um, Craig is a senior engineer and floodplain administrator for the city of Aurora. Um, he is a professional engineer and a CFM. Um, Mr. Pearl has over 20 years experience as a civil engineer and he has an emphasis on water resources, floodplain management, and land development in Colorado and Virginia. He has worked for consulting firms and for municipalities spending the past five years in Aurora's Public Works Department. Um, Craig, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Anita. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'm kind of representing the engineers, the kind of inside the box thinkers today, uh, and also representing the kind of interest of the department I work for as a public works department, and every city's got one of those. And uh, you know, I kind of want to ask the, or pose a rhetorical question of why do we need regulations? You know, developers uh, know their business. They hire planners, engineers, landscape architects, uh, people who who know what they're doing and are, are professionals. Uh, you go into the next slide, please. Uh, so we have the mantra, especially here in Colorado, I understand that that's also uh, really the, it came out of California originally and most parts of the country that development pays its own way. So whatever they need uh, to support a new community or new parts of the community, the developer has to pay for. So at least here, what that means is that the developers will actually construct uh, all the infrastructure, streets, storm drainage, uh, water supply, sanitary sewer. Uh, they also have to pay impact fees for all of the above, uh, as well as for the uh, construction of schools and parks. Uh, impact fees uh, have to do with both taking care of uh, not just the uh, immediately proximate uh, portions of the development. So for instance, you might build uh, the roads uh, that border your development, uh, but also uh, to take care of regional impacts. Uh, so your development will produce more traffic, therefore you'll need a increase in the road infrastructure everywhere, uh, which costs money. Uh, so we also talk about uh, the why do we need regulations. Really the main reason is at least the works the way that it works here is that everybody uh, excuse me, is that uh, basically the developers will build everything, uh, but then when they're done with it, it gets turned over to the municipality who will take ownership and maintenance responsibility for all the infrastructure in the long term. Uh, one more slide, please. Thank you, Nita. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go into that. So basically, if somebody's going to give you something and you're going to be responsible for taking care of it in perpetuity, you want to make sure it's done right. So we start off with doing engineering review of design. Uh, that's a fair amount of what I do and what uh, the staff that I work with does. Uh, is we have a very detailed you know, three-inch binder full of standards uh, about how you're going to design something. Uh, your roads, your sewers, everything. Uh, we get through and have approved plans. Uh, and then at the end, uh, uh, once you get to construction, uh, we have inspectors that go out and make sure everything is done right. Uh, that if it says you're going to put down uh, six inches of full depth asphalt, we have six inches of full depth asphalt, and that we take that samples back to the lab and make sure that they are, that that material is good uh, so that the the infrastructure lasts a long time. Uh, we also usually have a warranty period uh, around here. We do uh, one year uh, just to make sure that everything actually uh, stays in place uh, and performs well. Uh, in terms of those 
kind of regulations, uh, kind of echoing some themes that other presenters have talked about, is having something that's written down, uh, that's very specific and concrete, uh, is one of the best ways to get predictability for everyone uh, and to keep it uh, uh, fair uh, and make it a process that everybody can work with. So then talking about those standards, uh, there's a lot of a lot of standards out there. Uh, we have local, state, national, global engineering standards. I kind of put out a little bit of an alphabet soup here. Uh, UDFCD is the, here in, in the Denver area, the Urban Drainage and Flood Control District, uh, in addition to kind of local municipalities. Uh, and then uh, CDOT, or Colorado Department of Transportation, every state's got one of those. Uh, and they have their own technical standards. Uh, AASHTO is the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, uh, which is a promulgates a lot of uh, important rules and standards. Federal Highway Administration, and then the International Building Code is just another example. So why we have those standards, you know, is a good government official, I always have to think about why we're doing things. And it comes back to protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Uh, and as a professional engineer, safety is always on the top of that. Uh, but then also the, the welfare is about making sure that we have good infrastructures and uh, gives us, uh, helps us give us a good community, not just for today, but for the long term, you know, decades down the road. As a public works department, uh, you know, we have a budget. It's not actually all that big. Uh, so we want to minimize our future maintenance costs. Uh, and then finally, an uh, important part of those standards, and this is a lot where I think community input and input from elected officials is important, is reflecting local conditions and community values. You know, I think it could be sometimes frustrating to some developers, uh, engineers, planners, architects, uh, that why do we have a set of standards that's different than anybody else's? Well, you want to reflect those local conditions and community values. To give an example of a local condition, uh, so here in the, the Colorado Front Range, we really don't like uh, streets that have more than a 6% grade on them. Um, that's because we get snow here, and uh, as we did did this week, uh, which then turns into ice. So it's basically undrivable if you're much steeper than that. Uh, however, if you were in, say, San Francisco, not a problem. Uh, an example of a community value uh, that we sometimes experience here in Aurora. It's a very large community. Uh, we have a lot of annexed areas, which are still more rural in nature, uh, but we are a city. We're an urban community. So when you come in and develop, say, build a street here, uh, we expect that street is going to have curb and gutter. It's going to have street lights. It's going to have landscaping. Uh, whereas if you were just over a municipal boundary into an unincorporated county area, uh, you'd probably be looking at a, a ditch section road without street lights. Okay, so uh, talking then about uh, time frames, and this is where kind of trying to understand where everyone's coming from and different perspectives, uh, we definitely are looking at different things. Again, as an engineer and public works person, I expect major infrastructure to last a long time. You know, with a, a little bit of maintenance, a century is really, you know, 50, 100 years is really what we're looking for. Uh, I think that a lot of people in the, in the business have different perspectives. Uh, so a lot of your, when you're talking about, you know, residential projects, and we've got a lot of very large ones happening right now. Uh, they're looking to, in many cases, get something entitled uh, and maybe uh, sell it to another developer at that point, or perhaps get something entitled, build some of the major infrastructure, uh, but then start selling lots or land bays uh, to a home builder. So a lot of times they're looking at a, a time frame that's more like five years. Uh, big box retail stores, uh, some of the major chains that I won't name, they're looking at 15 to 20 year lifespans. And I think most communities you can see places where uh, they built a store once uh, and then they 15, 20 years later, uh, they shut it down and build a newer, bigger one half a mile down the road. Uh, so that has to be understood. Uh, I think we found, at least in our community, some of the commercial, industrial, and multifamily uh, developers are also the owners. Uh, they tend to have a longer lifespan and in some ways are some of the our best uh, partners. Uh, next, please. So you know, I've sat on both sides of the table, uh, public and private, mostly public. Uh, so 
know, I try to understand how the land development industry works. Uh, I'll give myself as, up as a member of Generation X. My conception, certainly before getting into the industry of land developers, was entirely based on Scooby-Doo cartoons, uh, where uh, you know, it would have worked if it wasn't for you meddling kids. Uh, someone is, you know, land developers, the bad guy who's trying to steal something from somebody. Uh, so it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Uh, one thing to understand is it's not a homogenous industry. You kind of maybe as a layperson would have the conception that you know somebody sees uh, you know a farm on the outskirts of town and says, "Gee, this would be a great place to put a single-family residential development." Let me give uh, you know, Farmer Joe here a big pile of cash for his land. Thank you. I'll take over that. Uh, then I'll design it. Then I'll get it approved. Then I'll start building it really doesn't work like that. Uh, a lot of times, uh, it's not a big pile of cash. Uh, it's actually uh, options and agreements. Uh, there's different players who are specialized into different niches in the development world. I have, would have to say in Colorado, I've seen more large developers uh, who are also home builders who are more of that monolithic uh, approach. Uh, when I was working in Northern Virginia, a lot of times there was, was more specialized uh, where, for instance, uh, one person would uh, get the option from the landowner, uh, get it through the entitlement process, uh, and then flip it at that point. Another point is that cash flow is really critical uh, in this industry. Uh, they don't have huge piles of cash sitting around. Um, in most cases, they're dealing with commercial financing. Uh, and what I've generally heard is things got really tight after the recession. They've been loosening up a bit, uh, but still commercial lenders are not giving the same kinds of uh, amounts of uh, of money at one time, uh, which is causing more phasing of development into smaller bits. Uh, it's also understanding how we as community officials have to work uh, with the developers. Um, you can't expect somebody to lay out $10 million for infrastructure before they get the first rooftop in. So that's when we get into things like phasing plans, like you know, you can build this part of this road and this storm sewer and that sanitary and you know, do some reasonable bits at a time, uh, which allow them to get some rooftops in and get some cash flow back in. Uh, at the same time, this is one of the things that we struggle with uh, quite a bit, uh, is that we need to make sure that it's not set up such that there's a piece of land left over at the end that's overburdened uh, with a, with infrastructure uh, and basic costs so that you end up with one piece of property at the end that never gets built and infrastructure that never gets built. So kind of the approach you take to us is to try to look for areas where we do have mutual interest. Uh, usually building a quality community is a mutual interest. Uh, being able to get you know high sale prices is an interest for the developer, which then leads into high property and hopefully sales tax uh, values for the community. And also understand that we do have some areas of inherent conflict, and that's OK. Uh, but for instance, the time frames and perspectives that we're looking at. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back to Anita. Hey, everyone. I apologize. I've been having a little difficulty with my audio. Um, that was a great presentation, Craig. I love how you uh, folded in a Scooby-Doo reference there. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, Russ Forrest who is the city manager for Gunnison, Colorado, and previously town manager in Snowmass Village and community development director for 15 years in Vail, Colorado. He started his professional career working for the U.S. Army Environmental Policy Institute, developing land use and environmental policy for the U.S. Army. Russ has a bachelor's and master's in urban and regional planning from the University of Illinois, and he is an AICP. Thank you, Anita. And Anita, just real quick, how many minutes should I take? Well, I Sorry about that. Quick, you did it again. I, I know we're uh, running why don't you go? <laughs> yeah, we're running a little over, but I think, uh, Christine, 10 minutes, does that sound good? I would say 10 to 15, and you'll be okay. I think as long as we have 15 minutes for questions, we'll be all right. Okay, great. <laughs> well, again, thank you, Anita, for that introduction. Good morning from... Uh, Gunnison, Colorado, um, and just to give you a qu quick set in terms of where I'm from, 
We've, we're high up in the Rocky Mountains, two beautiful ski areas, 750 miles of single track, a four-year university, and we still have authentic uh, ranchers uh, working and living in our community. So we're passionate about land use and land use planning is important. As a city manager, I've got two high level goals uh, for my planning team. One is that our staff applies our land use code to applications fairly and partially and transparently uh, so that the applicant and interested parties walk away saying, I got a fair shake. I, I maybe didn't get everything I wanted, kind of like Carrie mentioned, but I got a fair shake. The second goal I have is that the code, the land use code actually supports the city's strategic goals and it's efficient for both staff and the developer. So you just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, with this slide, I just wanted to acknowledge the development review process can actually go sideways before you even get an application. And with a large development uh, application, there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of money behind it. And like also Carrie was saying, um, the developer really wants a level of predictability. So one of the things they'll often do is reach out to your decision makers. They'll wanna sit down with them, they'll wanna bounce the idea off. In the state of Colorado, and Randy kind of mentioned this, um, you know, you can technically sit down with that elected official before an application is made. However, from a best management standpoint, I would never recommend that. Um, again, and when an application is submitted, your decision makers are acting like a judge and they should think of themselves nearly wearing a gown like a judge and they have to be impartial and they have to be perceived as being impartial. So it's just fine for staff to meet for developers, but please coach your elected officials, your planning commissioners to not meet with developers individually. Now there's another role we play. Uh, when we have, are talking about policy, changing the land use code, we're now in a legislative mode. And again, you know, talk to your attorneys, but sometimes uh, city attorneys will actually encourage elected officials to roll up their sleeves in the produce aisle. And I don't know why it's always in the produce aisle that you get cornered, um, you know, by the public or with developers and talk about land use change. However, I would still encourage planning commissioners and elected officials when that happens uh, to encourage those, that feedback uh, in public hearings, in public meetings, so their colleagues can hear the same thing. So again, uh, coach your elected officials and your planning commissioners when they get caught in the, the produce aisle uh, to invite those individuals to either provide their comments in writing or come to the hearings so that everybody uh, can hear those thoughts. Next slide, please. So one of the roles of a manager, and this has been mentioned in a couple different ways by previous speakers, is to make sure there's good systems for communication. And again, uh, I think uh, Carrie mentioned that communication is key, and it really is. So I first encourage the developer to practice the good neighbor policy. So before an application is even submitted, that they go around their site and talk to all the adjacent property owners and affected stakeholders before an application is made. One, just to connect with that individual, particularly if they're new in the community, and so that the adjacent property owners understand what's being proposed and what's gonna come through the process and that will make your life a lot easier. Sometimes issues, problems are resolved before it even gets to you in an application. Then an application comes, and again, it's really critical right up front um, to sit down with the key uh, parties within your organization, planners, public works, emergency services, mass transit, sometimes, you need to invite others from outside of your organization, such as school district, utility companies, sit down and have the developer present the application and then talk about how the various codes, stipulations across the organization apply to that application. Um, 
again, this is intended to reduce surprises in the process, increase predictability. And another thing I really, really emphasize to my staff is to not do the ping pong game so that that developer is kind of hearing one unified uh, approach, but all the diversity of issues and concerns. And sometimes at that pre-app, meaning you gotta be direct and upfront with that developer and tell them, ooh, the way you're going will not lead to success. I just wanna tell you now, but then work with them and facilitate the process and give them suggestions about how they can be su successful in your process. And then once they get through the process, and particularly for a large project, uh, sit down and have a pre-construction meeting, again, with a lot of those same players, so that you can really map out and plan for and avoid and mitigate the impacts of construction. And again, when there's big issues with construction, you know, that manager and that planning director are gonna begin to get calls. So if you can avoid that, you're gonna save a lot of time. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the key things uh, that uh, a manager really uh, needs to do is when things get hot, when things get political in you know, land use issues, uh, particularly in, in our mountain communities and, and around the country, you know, people are passionate about land use, um, but a manager has got to create the, say, the space so that the professional planning staff can make recommendations uh, without uh, the politics. Uh, and staff needs to facilitate you know, that development review process uh, and work with that developer, provide suggestions and feedback to them as they go through the process. Again, hopefully minimizing uh, surprises in the process. The other thing that as a manager in, you know, I'd suggest as a planning director, you really need to keep an eye on is are your decision makers understanding the project? And you got to look at their body language. You got to see, are they asking questions? If they're not, sometimes you got to prompt uh, questions around what you know are difficult issues. Maybe you need to nudge your planning commissioners, your elected officials to ask questions, to inquire so again, you really want to keep an eye on whether your decision makers are truly understanding the application in front of them and that they clearly understand the criteria by which they're applying to that application. Uh, the other thing as a planner, I've just had to learn the hard way, you have got to follow your process. Um, and in the state of Colorado, if you don't follow your process, you're going to get something called a 106 claim and you're going to lose. So, you know, and it's often the mundane things of making sure the public notice gets in on time for the X number of days. You got to make sure that uh, the hearing is done appropriately. But at the same time in saying follow your process, like Randy was saying, if you're seeing too many problems with variances or that the process is broken, you're empowered to make recommendations to fix it. Next slide, please. So again, you've heard us all say, no one likes surprises. And sometimes you gotta work with your planning commissions and your city council and you gotta tell them, hey, don't surprise me uh, during that public hearing. If you're gonna ask a question or want additional information, let me know ahead of time so that staff or the applicant can be prepared to respond to that question. And again, everybody hears the question, Every, the, uh, either the applicant or staff are prepared to respond to the question, um, and everybody hears the same information. Um, again, um, reminding people of their roles, and that is just an ongoing challenge with planning commissions, elected officials, and staff, is making sure that everyone is playing their role, that staff is supporting the elected officials, the elected officials are utilizing the land use uh, code and the criteria for it in making their decisions. Um, one thing I've often seen is that elected officials and planning commissions sometimes get too hung up that they have to be unanimous or that the 
planning staff recommendation has to be the same as the planning commission's recommendation and the city council's uh, de final decision. It's all right uh, if you have different opinions. Now, if you begin to see a trend where staff recommendations are not supported by planning commission or council, that's something you want to take a step back and analyze and think about. Um, and again, you know, something I've always had to emphasize, if your process isn't giving you the desired goal, or it's inefficient, or it's creating unnecessary process and bureaucracy, you are empowered to change it, and there's always a process in your land use code to do it. Next slide, please. So one of the, the roles of a manager is uh, sometimes to acknowledge reality, even if it is uncomfortable. And that's something, again, you've just got to coach your planning commissioners, your city council members, that if there's a problem, if we make a mistake and we're humans and we make mistakes, if you had that ex parte uh, communication and you got into a discussion in the produce aisle, you need to acknowledge it and you can fix it. So again, making sure and helping to create a safe environment. So if a mistake or a problem happens, uh, that whether it's an elected official or it's staff, first you can acknowledge and recognize the issue and then fix it. Oftentimes, if there is a process problem, all you really need to do is replay the process. Now, sometimes that can be painful if you're delaying an applicant, but it's better to have a clean process, and I've had those conversations with applicants, than to have a process that's flawed that opens you up to litigation. Um, so again, you know, that manager really has to create that safe environment to make sure that staff can provide honest professional recommendations, and that if there's a problem or a challenge that comes up, that it's recognized and fixed in the process. So again, thank you. Hopefully not everybody's like that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, Anita, do you have any closing remarks or should I just go ahead and jump into questions? You know, why don't you just go ahead and jump into questions? Okay, great. All right, so, all right, let's see. The first one is gonna be for Carrie. Carrie, you mentioned that developers value value flexibility in standards. Uh, I had always been under the mistaken impression that developers might want more generous or less strict standards, but that flexibility and discretion just adds to uncertainty about what you can get approval for. So this person is asking, what is the value of flexibility itself for developers? Great question, thank you. Um, flexibility is um, really important for developers in terms of, when I say flexibility, I'm talking about um, having in your code provisions for um, administrative adjustments. So that not everything has to go through a public process to go through a public hearing, um, that there are administrative review processes within your code. So as a planner, you are empowered to um, go ahead and you know set forth or recommend changes to your land use regulations that embed that level level of flexibility within your your regulations, which um, helps with the predictability through the development review process. Does that answer that question? Sounds good to me. Um, if, if, the if the asker has anything further, um, please just feel free to reach out directly to Carrie. The next question is going to be for Craig. Craig, do you have a prorate share fee for offsite improvements? And if so, what is your formula? Generally, we don't uh, try to keep it uh, 
fairly simple uh, in terms of, for instance, if you're developing a section of land, you have to build half of the roads on on the outside. There's a few cases where we'll, you know, might kick a little money to you know make a sidewalk connection or make some infrastructure that makes sense, but that's generally not something that we do in this community. And um, while I still uh, have you unmuted, what suggestions do you have when you find that your planning board is not following the long-term plan? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. And if anyone else wants to jump in and rescue Craig, feel free. Please. Well, I know, you know, this, this is Russ Forrest. Um, you know, one of the things you can do, and that's really, really common, you know, is the application consistent with uh, your master plan, your comp plan. And so as staff, it's important to, you know, illustrate, you know, where is this application in conformance, not conformance with your comp plan. So we actually have an obligation to remind and, and and point that out to our decision makers. I guess I would say that uh, also those plans can be changed, but that requires a public process and usually interaction uh, input from the elected mm -hmm. officials. Yep. Okay, this one is gonna be for Russ. Russ, if I am the planner working for the city and during the presentation, um, on a project, disclose a conflict of interest based on past good relations with council, will the council's decision making get tainted? Should I have just recused at the start of the project, um, which may not be feasible in small towns where it's a one-man show and you can't really recuse yourself? Uh, what are your thoughts? So if I understood that correctly, the planner is saying, I may have some kind of conflict of interest with uh, an applicant or application. Did I understand that correctly? That's how I'm interpreting it, yes. Okay, um, so that does happen a lot in a small community. Um, and so the first recommendation is to sit down you know, with your manager, your attorney, and walk through what is that relationship. Because the reality is we still have to make decisions in a small community. And yep, we might know everybody. They might somehow be related to us. And so have that conversation. Talk about first, is there any sort of financial uh, conflict where you or a family member could make money, lose money? That's a really bright line. But if it's I just know this person, I've had a relationship with this individual somehow. Um, that may not be a bright line conflict. Um, and oftentimes, you know, ideally at the beginning of the process, if there is something gray, you acknowledge it publicly. And in a public hearing, hey, you know, my wife uh, works for this individual. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge this right up front. Um, so as a staff person, you know, acknowledging that, um, it becomes more of a significant issue if you're a decision maker, an elected official or planning commissioner, um, in terms of really closely looking at same process, talk to your city attorney, uh, go through that, analyze it. Um, oftentimes it's the same outcome where you want to acknowledge that relationship right up front. And if there is a bright line, then you do need to accuse yourself. Thank you. And I think that really, uh, you know, a lot of it, the, the, the person who asked the question also said that perhaps that they might own some property in the vicinity, perhaps of some project or application that um, they might be, uh, financially impacted on, you know, there's just going to come the point where you really just have to think ethically, uh, you know, d do I need to recuse myself? It's, I don't think it's really black and white, is it? It's, well, I, I just had that situation. A part, a project is being proposed near my home that would probably have a positive impact on my house. So I simply said publicly, you know, this project, I'm, you know, I'm going to treat this in a very unbiased way. 
uh, it may have a positive impact on my house. I just want to acknowledge it. There isn't another city manager that can really take my place in that situation, but it was important for me to acknowledge that upfront and publicly. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, Carrie, you're up on deck. What are your recommendations uh, for nonprofits and neighbors when participating in the public hearing process? So often our only chance to be heard is during the public hearing, but this is often too late and isn't the right platform to find compromise. Uh, another really great question. For nonprofits, um, you know, there, there are other avenues to uh, voice uh, concerns, and those uh, include in writing as well. Uh, most communities, are, well, in Colorado anyway, um, the, there's three outlets for public notice. And one would be um, the, in writing and then uh, posting the property, actually posting the sign, and um, and then posting uh, add in the local local newspaper. Um, a great tip for um, actual planners uh, working for a municipality, um, if there if they there is a nonprofit organization that is really involved in land use matters, is to build a relationship with the um, with that the uh, community development office, um, sign up to get um, any newsletters, just like you do for like neighborhood organizations, those types of things, so that you could get a referral. That's the fourth way. Um, through the uh, development review process, there's normally a uh, anywhere from 21 to 30 day referral process, and the application goes out to everybody on that master referral list. And so if that neighborhood organization can get on that list, then um, that would uh, open the dialogue. Um, they can, you know, send comments in writing and then potentially, um, you know, sit down with the developer one on one to uh, work out any issues. Thank you. Uh, this next question is really for anyone. Um, do you have regular workshops or review sessions regarding the long range plan for your planning commissioners? and or public officials? Um, this is Randy. I'd like to give that one a shot if I can. The um, town of Estes Park and uh, Larimer County, uh, unincorporated Estes Valley are going through this right now. And I would strongly recommend uh, what I call a pre-planning process before you even get into the planning process. Now it does require budget allocation, which we were, able to manage here, but we engaged a consulting firm to uh, pre-plan, meaning get our public engagement uh, folks uh, listed and start dialogue with those on a, a sort of longer uh, pre-budget uh, pre and pre-planning element so that we understood that we were even asking the right questions. We did that last year. It took about uh, three, four months, four months total. And we came up with a plan for a plan. Now, I mean, that sounds like a thing that only planners could love, right? But it actually, <laughs> it actually got us a, a good bit of mileage. We're ready to hit the ground running with a true public engagement process. So I, I think that's a great idea. This is Anita, um, and I just wanted to chime in on that question as well. Um, I am actually, in addition to being the mayor pro tem of Westminster, I'm on the APA Colorado's board as a public official representative. And that's one of our goals here in Colorado is to provide um, really more training and programming for um, planners, or I'm sorry, for um, planning commissioners and for elected officials so they really understand both what the criteria is and why. Um, separately from that, in my own community, we're currently updating our comprehensive plan and our design um, requirements and guidelines. Um, and so we've really used that as an opportunity 
um, to re-educate, um, that's the horrible word, you should never say re-educate, um, but to educate um, our uh, elected officials, our planning commissioners, but then also just the community at large um, as to the goals of planning and why it's important um, in crafting the community we want to live in. Thank you, Anita. Okay, next one, Carrie, we're back to you again. Uh, put on that developer hat. So as a planner, I've often heard from developers or consultants that, for instance, a project just won't pencil out financially unless X many units are allowed. But I've never been presented with, with the information. Why can't I see the numbers? Staff and decision makers are just supposed to take these statements on face value. So I guess I would add also to that question, um, you know, how can a planner respectfully say, give me the details? That's a great question that, uh, yes, the, this um, <laughs> this person's right. Developers never want to get. <laughs> That's the uh, 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 question of death there. But um, it's very fair to ask for a fiscal impact analysis. It is fair to ask about, um, you know, if, if they're, you know, what are the lending practices? What are their challenges that they're facing? And uh, developers will reluctantly um, actually provide that information, but they will if if you ask that. And from you as a, a planner, what would be really important is to let the developer know that the information that they're providing if they're sharing their pro forma or they're sharing their numbers, that the, that remains very confidential and um, acknowledge that that's important for them, for their competition, their business people, and they wanna make sure that um, you know the, the information, the numbers that they're sharing with you in your office are not gonna go anywhere else. So um, those are just some good tips on how to coax them to, to give you that information as well. Would anyone else like to comment on this question? Um, this is Russ. We, we're going through an RFP process for a public-private partnership, uh, looking for a, a private partner to develop a housing project. And actually, in the RFP, we said that you need to supply a performa and that um, that that pro forma would be something that will be public and it'll be something that we use if we have to make trade-offs so we can be informed um, kind of to the question that's being asked if we reduce the density is the project still affordable um, and we can do that in a public-private uh, partnership but when you can see the numbers and you can communicate it uh, it, it can be helpful, but you got to be upfront about those expectations with the developer. Thank you. Okay, next one. Uh, for anyone, how do you integrate equity and inclusion issues in the development process? How effective are current review processes? Anyone want to take a stab at this one? Maybe one of our planners want to start? Um, Christine, this is Anita. The question was equity inclusion. How do you promote equity inclusion in the process? Is, am yeah. I correct? Correct. Okay. So for me, that's really upstream <laughs> it is the first way, right? So when we're determining um, what our comp plan looks like, that needs to be a goal. Um, of our comp plan is to promote equity and inclusion um, within our community. And so we're making decisions really at an upstream um, point as to what we want the our community to look like and what are the best land use, um, transit, um, you know, areas of economic opportunity. Um, how do we want those to flow through in our, our community? 
um, then it's a matter of process and making sure that community engagement is not just a checkoff bar, uh, mark on a box, but really something that we do to make sure our residents feel that they have a voice in the process. Um, so th that means um, making sure that we um, require the developer to um, reach out to the community and encourage those early stakeholder meetings. Uh, hi, this is Randy, and uh, I completely agree with Anita. It's the upstream part that's the important thing to set the anchor for that. The only thing I would add is that if it's possible to have that conversation about equity and inclusion with any and every developer, it doesn't, uh, you, you know, if you don't have it in your code, you shouldn't cite the code as a requirement, certainly, but it is important to let the developer know that it's a value for your community and for uh, staff and decision makers. I would suggest that conversation is always a good one to have. Okay. Um, I think. I think we can do one more question as long as Anita's computer doesn't die. Oh, it looks like you just plugged it in. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I've been watching I it thinking, screen. oh, her computer's going to die any moment now. <laughs> um, I think we can take one last question. This one, this one's kind of, this is interesting. Uh, I, I'm curious to hear how uh, you folks uh, will respond to this. So the question is, as a millennial planner, I feel like there is uh, oftentimes, sometimes, an unspoken generation gap when I work with developers and elected officials. Can anyone speak on how to navigate those gaps? Um, this goes to maybe Anita's point, and I, I think it's going back to the upstream process of making sure you're inclusive in terms of different cultural components of your community, but also from an age standpoint. And one of the things we've really embraced having a four-year university is pulling in, uh, we actually have a uh, university student that sits with our city council. We have a university student that actually and does a wonderful job, sits on our planning commission, and we're doing that purposefully to make sure that we have diversity, you know, at least from an age standpoint, um, within both our council hearings, our city council, or in our planning commission meetings. Um, and then the other thing, particularly with long range planning, and we're also embarking on a comp plan, um, we're specifically going to different age groups, having focus group meetings as we develop our comp plan, and then, you know, eventually we'll, we'll change land use code. Uh, but with high school students, with uh, university students, uh, and also, you know, other ends of the demographic uh, with uh, seniors, and, and going uh, to our Latino uh, community, um, you know, through, particularly through our faith-based uh, organizations. Um, so we, we purposely try to populate both planning commission and have a voice, um, you know, with our uh, our city council. Okay, um, I so I'm going to wrap up here. Time flies. Uh, this was a really great panel and uh, a diverse panel. This was really helpful, um, and we had a ton of people on this call, and I apologize, we just could not get to all those questions. So feel free to reach out directly to the panelists. We will have a recording of this presentation available on our YouTube channel. Uh, just search planning webcast on YouTube. We'll have a PDF of this presentation also available at the conclusion, or now, as soon as we get off here, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Uh, thank you to the Colorado chapter for hosting today's session and Sheila Booth, if, if you're hanging around in the background there, thanks to you for all your coordination on this and working with us at the planning webcast consortium. Uh, and thanks to everybody for joining us. Carrie, Craig, Randy, Russ, Anita, thanks to all of you. And uh, everyone, we will talk next time. Have a great weekend.